I founded the Virtual Human Interaction Lab in 2003. The goal of the lab is to study how virtual reality changes behavior, how applications using VR can change society, and how to understand the way virtual experiences feel real. So when you have the glasses on, it really does transport you into the environment that you're in. It's still a kind of video game style pixelation, um, so it doesn't look like reality. Um, but when I was asked to walk across this plank when there was floor like 20 feet down, it really felt scary and my heart started racing. Um, and I really felt like I was gonna fall off. When I was actually doing the choral educational thing, it was, it was more like kind of watching a screensaver or something because I couldn't move. So I was just watching things until I got less of the, the virtual reality effect from that. I also started to feel a little bit um, uh, motion sick or a little nauseous just standing there um, looking at one thing because I think like the water was moving. So it started to play tricks with my vision. You have now become a piece of coral. Look down at your body as the net continues to bump into you. Look above you at the fish swimming in schools. What makes my lab stand out is that we don't just build the technology, we study the way it changes someone's behavior. In order to do that, we have a huge web of collaborators. The coral reef that you saw was done with uh, an education technologist in the School of Ed, his name is Roy P., and with Fio Michelli, who is the marine scientist that discovered that reef off the coast of Ischia. So we've literally built her coral reef that she's used to uh, teach the world about acidification, and we work with her often to make sure the scientific details are right. The rig that we just saw downstairs there, um, could you have made that 11 years ago? So the, the technology behind virtual reality has moved at a snail's pace for the last 15 years or so. Only up until the last two years have we seen drastic changes in the technologies. First in 2010 was a device called the Microsoft Connect. Today, when you came to the lab, uh, we strapped uh, LEDs on your body. That's so we can get precise measurement of what we call tracking your body movements. Um, what the Connect did is allows a system to track your body movements without you wearing any marker. So that was kind of the first step when we entered this hockey stick function where uh, VR started getting very accessible and very cheap and very good. Uh, obviously, the, the helmet that you wore and my lab is from a company called Enviz, uh, and it's a great head-mounted display, uh, but it costs in the tens of thousands of dollars. What the Oculus Rift does, as well as other products, for example, uh, the Morpheus by Sony and a few other companies that are developing this technology, now that the giants care about VR, what you're seeing is they're getting lighter, they're getting more comfortable, they're getting cheaper, and, and the quality is, qu is quite good. So we're at that moment in the sort of classic adoption curve where technologies that were only available to kind of researchers and industry a few years ago are now starting to filter out into a consumer function? Absolutely. So Jaron Lanier, the guy that coined the term virtual reality, has always said that VR is never going to matter if you have to have million dollar labs at universities to, to get it out there. And, and what the new technologies are doing are bringing it from the laboratory into the living room. And we're starting to see that tipping point now. Feel the vibrations in the floor? I do. You will see a digital representation of yourself called an avatar. When, it, when people think about virtual reality right now, uh, the foremost thing I think that comes to mind is gaming. What are some of the other applications that we either are starting to see VR being used for or will see it used for in the next few years? Let me tell you about some projects that we have in the lab. So, so one of them is to train people how to lose weight and to eat healthier by showing you your avatar become idealized uh, that is uh, healthier as a function of your behavior. So if you're jogging in place and you see your avatar slowly lose pounds, then that inspires you to exercise more than just about any control condition someone has tried. A different example is for treating people who have got pain. Preliminary data are showing that kids who've got these pain syndromes, by putting them in avatars that help them move their body, uh, this makes them feel better. Can you tell me a little bit about how you work with uh, the technology industry? Do they uh, is there an interchange between your lab and the, the big tech companies? We have constant contact with corporations, most of whom at this point really need to understand how the technology works, how it's going to apply to their business area, and how you can use it to change human behavior. And how about uh, government defense applications? I also work with the Army, with the Department of Defense, uh, and other parts of the government. We wanted to teach U.S. soldiers what it was like to be an Iraqi citizen, uh, the people they were there to protect. 
Uh, so it's hard to read a manual and understand what it's like to be someone in Iraq. We built a simulation where they went to a virtual mirror and they felt themselves and saw themselves as an Iraqi citizen. When you walk a mile in someone else's shoes, when you literally become someone else uh, in the same way uh, that you guys became Coral upstairs, uh, when you feel like you are someone else, you gain empathy towards them.